Hey guys, welcome to Unusual Activity. Yes, I am not George Avedon. I'm filling in for him today. My name is Amar. I'm the creator, owner, genius behind Financial Juice. So uh, thanks everyone for chiming in and joining our little session today. I'm very modest, as you can tell. I'm only joking. Um, so today uh, we would normally go through the news at this point, um, but uh, I think you know we've got an interesting guy on with us today. So I thought we'd jump straight into the interview and throw some ideas around and hopefully you guys can take away um, some great information that you can apply to your own trading, hopefully take you in some new directions and uh, learn from the experience of someone that's been around in the market for a long time. So without further ado, let me bring in uh, Brandon Fredrickson from iFiedWallStreet.com. Hey Brandon. Hey, how's it going man? It's good man, how are you? Not too bad. Hey, this is uh, you know, a good day to have the new guy doing the interview because I'm about the most technically challenged person that you'll uh, that you'll meet so yeah man. way to go man way to go no worries no worries we were trying to get a screen share going but it didn't quite work out so hopefully during the show we'll probably get something working um, so so Brandon let's let's start from the beginning how how did you get involved in the markets and where did you start out um, yeah, I grew up in Iowa on a farm uh, I wanted to be a floor trader, you know, like in the pits in Chicago and all that. Um, and uh, then I went to college, you know, in the mid-90s. And by the time I graduated, it was really everything was going to the computers. And, and it was a stock market, you know, the bull market and stocks was starting. And uh, so I was uh, down at WEEG, which is the, the University of Iowa's computer center back then, and uh, was trying to figure out my future one day. And I uh, typed in day trading or something. And, and came across this thing called SOS so, and, and the ECNs, which was uh, the, the beginnings of direct access trading is what that was. And it was, you know, day trading. And, uh, and so I saw that, you know, when they were talking about what, what was the possibility of this with these ECN platforms and that uh, and direct access is that you could buy at the bid and you could sell at the ask. And I thought, holy crap, this is, you know, this is why I wanted to be a floor trader. So, uh, so I can, you know, instead of just going down there and just trading wheat or beans or cows or, you know, being in one pit, only doing one thing, I could trade everything in the market. And, uh, and of course, that really appealed to my ADD. And uh, so I went out and, um, and actually, I, I got really lucky. A friend of mine and I had gone to one of these, uh, you know, like real estate seminars where they tell you to... Um, you know, buy a piece of property that the government has confiscated from someone for not paying their taxes, and uh, and we managed to do that, and we got really lucky. I mean, we each made about ten grand, so I had that money. Oh, so those and, ads uh, are actually real. Huh? So those ads you see in the paper where you can buy, you know, real estate that the government has confiscated—that's real. That's not a scam. I've seen oh, yeah, them yeah, before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean it's it's just you know it sucks for the poor guy. The government stole his property from, I guess. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and you know, and it's hard too. I mean, I, that, what I'm saying is, is we got really lucky because um, you know usually there's so much competition in, in something like that that uh, very little property. I will tell you though, like in some states, for example, Iowa, where I'm from, you can go in, and this is something I still do with my money. Uh, you can go in, and when people owe. Uh, when people owe taxes, uh, you can then pay their taxes for them, right? Uh, at a certain point, it, uh, once it goes into default, you pay their taxes for them, and um, and there's a competitive bidding process on what interest rate you will charge them, okay? And uh, like in Iowa, I think the maximum rate starts off, I'm trying to think, I think it starts off around like 12% or somewhere around there. Usually, it ends up being about five or six percent because it's competitive. You know, I'll loan you the money for five percent or six percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: you're absolutely guaranteed that five or six percent because if they don't pay it, then you do own their house. And so it, it's a really good investment. And you know, I mean, with interest rates the way they are right now, yeah. you know, five six percent is a good guaranteed return. Uh, beats bonds, you know. So, um, but yeah, so that was like I said how I got started, and. Um, and I just I opened up my account with uh, with MB Trading, and uh, it took me a couple of weeks to lose half of my money. So. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's how I got started. So so I finally got when I lost. Um, I was down to like 
right around five thousand bucks, mm -hmm. and and this is when my trading like finally really turned around because um, my girlfriend at the time, and we were serious, you know, we we ended up, uh, gosh, we were together for eleven years before she finally got sick of me, um, but but she told me she said, you know, Brandon, if you lose one thousand dollars more, you're done. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got an anthropology degree, man. What else am I going to do? And uh, so I had to make this thing work. Yeah. And, and I did. You know, I, I went and, uh, and I really started studying. You know, I, I, really, I really dug into, like, some of the classic books, like, like Market Wizards and, you know, William O'Neill. Um, I studied a lot of Linda Rashke's stuff, um, you know, and Trader Vic, a lot of the older books that are out there. Um, and uh, yeah, and a, a guy named Barry Rudd, who's actually a really good friend of mine, uh, read his book about breakouts and you know intraday breakouts and different things like that. And uh, but I also one of the things that I started to sort of realize is that the whole kind of real ADD approach that I had, trying to buy at the bid, sell at the ass. Uh, you know, now keep in mind back then, you know, stocks traded in increments of one quarter, so they were priced like. Uh, you know, I, was, I mean, they weren't priced how they are now. Um, you know, like if a stock was 33 and eighths, you know, that's, they were priced in eighths and quarters in that. Mm -hmm. And um, so you actually could make a spread, but you were competing against, you know, all of the market makers and, and everything like this. And, and I just didn't have an edge in that. But I could do research. I could follow the market. I could learn about technical analysis. And, and sort of follow where the money is going and, and follow what a stock is doing and, and kind of take some um, take some cues from that and sort of so yeah that's what I've done since uh, you know so like 1998 absolutely and is that kind of how you've been trading ever since or have you has your approach changed evolved at all um I've gotten I guess as I get older I've got you know more going on and mm -hmm. so I'm I'm a little bit uh, not as you know I, I suppose I try and do over time just try and get more out of less. I think everybody kind of does that, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, but pretty much the same. I mean, yeah, I'm just I'm looking at you know stocks that that unusual things are happening in. I mean, if you look at um, well, for example, this summer when I shorted oil. Um, it was right when everything was starting with ISIS, and, and you and I were talking about this, and and everybody was, oh, you know, oil is gonna go crazy, and um, and it was just hanging out, it was just hanging out, it was just hanging out, and and so I shorted oil, and and it was actually only like two dollars off the top price of oil, and and I only just covered that a month ago, and. Um, so things like that, or even like you know, yesterday. Here's here's an example just from yesterday. Uh, look at the managed care stocks uh, like Humana, or something like um, you know, United Here United Health or Aetna. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is why this is unusual because actually, you know, the government came out and said they're going to be paying these companies less money. And if you pull up your charts, you'll look and you'll see that they all broke out to the upside. And and they all broke out to the upside pretty strongly, um, and they're doing it out of nice bases, and so that's kind of an unusual thing, um, and that's always kind of an ideal situation because, you know, if you if you find yourself in a situation where where what's supposed to happen isn't happening, that's usually like a really really strong indicator to you it should be. Uh, an indication to dig deeper, maybe, and uh, and probably that it's, it's worth you know being involved in something like that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So you know, going on to your current methodology and what you're doing right now, break break down, you know, what you're looking for. You you mentioned that you do some technical stuff as well. You know, break down your setup and the day to day nuts and bolts of, um, you know, what does Brandon Fredrickson do? Sure. Um, well, you know, I, I, I try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking for things that are, you know, to buy it. I, I'd like it to be in an uptrend or at least um, bottoming out. You know, if it's 
if you see something that's revert, you know, just tanked and then spiked back up on heavy volume, uh, so it's broke a trend line. You know, I want to see something of an uptrend in place or or a, a downtrend line broken to buy it and a, and a heavy volume breakout. Uh, ideally, I'd like to see it have you know good earnings, kind of a, a real classic William O'Neill approach. Although mm -hmm. I personally, you know, sometimes there's a sector and there's a mania going on in a sector like with the biotechs right now. And you can look at a lot of these little biotechs like, um, you know, like TSRO or PCYC, different companies like this. And, um, you know, these are like $2 billion market cap companies and they have zero sales and all they have are a stock are, is a, they just have a drug rather that is in in research. It's not even approved yet. So this is nothing but just gambling, really. But the market's in kind of a state with it. I mean, if you look at, there's tons of these little biotechs that are going off like this, and so there's like a mini bubble happening. And you know, you've got to be careful. It's certainly not something that that you want to put all of your eggs into. But um, you know, that's something you can make a lot of money on. I mean, there was a situation like that. You know, when I started trading. I made a ton of money on Amazon and Yahoo and all those stocks before they were ever making money too, and so I try not to be too um, I try not to be too rigid about that. But mostly, I'm just I'm looking for growth stocks, really, you know, momentum, growth, whatever you want to call it. Okay, you mentioned an inter interesting point there, a biotech bubble. Do you think we're in the latter stages of that, or is that just getting started? Because you know the market's at kind of all-time highs and everything's going crazy. How is the biotech side of things in comparison to the market itself? See, I always try to. Here's what happens to me every time I, I really try and try and time one of these things. Yeah. Then I end up, you know, just getting overconfident or I end up missing stuff. And so I really do as much as possible. Just try and take things like day to day and week to week. Sure. Um, so you know, every weekend I'll look at my weekly charts, and I'll sort of, and that's kind of like as far out as I try to look. Um, just because otherwise, if if you end up getting like really, really committed to an opinion, uh, sometimes it blinds you to what's really going on. And so I just I really try and, and maintain that discipline. I mean, I don't always do it. But mm -hmm. that's the ideal, and it's kind of what I try to do, is, is just to be able to take things a little bit day by day, because you do have to, to stay pretty flexible. And, and I think it's really, it's even more important now because, uh, you know, especially in the last couple of years, I mean, it's really getting to where a lot of AIs are, are doing a lot of the trading now. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's getting to a point where, you know, you really, really have to be a lot more flexible, I think, today to make money than you did, um, you know, certainly back when I started. I mean, if I was a, a brand new trader today and and I didn't have, you know, pretty close to, gosh, 17 years experience, I guess, yeah, around 17, 18 years experience, um, if I didn't have that now, I don't know how easy it would be to, um, you know, to walk into the market today, and and sort of pick up from scratch and learn. Just because there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of what I used to do in terms of like stop placements and uh, different and even entries in that. There's there's just seems to be a lot more, you know, kind of shake and bake, fake out sort of things, and. Um, and I don't know that I would have had the the confidence to kind of sit through them because, uh, you know, as a trader, you're always kind of going through this torture with your stops, and or at least I always did. Um, yeah. You know, either not holding them or getting out too early, and uh, and that sort of thing is just really killer now. The way the the way everything sort of moves around so quickly, you know. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to pick up, just go back to one point about the the biotech side of things. Uh, yeah. It's it's just interesting to me. Um, uh, regarding like the whole bubble aspect of it all, I, I know this is a kind of an obvious, obvious type of question to answer. But what do you think is actually driving that bubble? I mean, what what are the kind of specific factors in place that are kind of pushing these valuations of these companies that don't seem to be making you know masses of profits? I mean, I think this is just you know my opinion, but I, I think that if if you look at the way our whole economy has been. 
uh, since you know before 2000, yeah. there's been incentives to create bubbles because it's the only place that wealth is being created. Um, you're not seeing growth in wages at all. In fact, if you look at um, I hate to sound like Occupy Wall Street, but in the United States, if you look at the income growth, actual income growth of the um, the bottom 95% of the population, if you look at that from 1979 until now, it's actually down adjusted for inflation. And so all of the gains that we've had in income has actually been in the top 5%. But the um, the upper, you know, like third, which is kind of the equity class, and uh, we're the ones that, you know, mortgaged our houses and, and took out second loans and, and uh, the consumer economy, they're having their money in, in different areas. And so I think that there's just, there is a big incentive to create bubbles. And so, um, and so I think that actually you're seeing bigger bubbles than, um, than a lot of what we've seen in the past. I mean, whether it's, you know, bonds are a huge bubble, I think, uh, doesn't mean it's going to break. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the same with, with the biotechs and, uh, you know, let's we'll go back to real estate, go back to, you know, to tech stocks and, and this and that, but it's also the nature of, of the market. I mean, um, you know, you can read the book, Extraordinary Delusions and Madness of Crowds and everything. And, you know, it's, or, and go all the way back to you know tulips and, and the Louisiana land bubble and all of these things. I mean, there's just a there's a human tendency, I guess, to be overly optimistic in the good times and overly pessimistic in the bad times, and so that creates these you know manias and bubbles, and then also you know huge downswings too. So, so I think it's just a, a function of who we are as people, as much as it is that then also that there's this incentive to create it right now too. Absolutely, yeah. Very interesting thoughts there. Uh, I wanted to double back a little bit on your setup and what you look for itself. It sounds like a very straightforward, simple way of looking at the market. You're essentially looking for momentum plays. Would that be correct in saying? You're yeah, looking for breakouts from trend lines, was it? Yeah, well, that would be like if, if it's a reversal. But, you know, I mean, if you all want to bring up like a chart, just bring up Humana. Uh, you know, HUM will be the symbol on your. I, I wish I could. This is not my trading computer, so I don't have any chart set up on it. For anybody listening, you know, just bring up Humana. Um, okay. And like I said, I apologize for being uh, technologically incompetent here and unable to share my uh, my screen. But Humana is just a very, very classic breakout. Uh, it was a base traded flat until uh, until yesterday broke out on high volume. Or another example, this was. Um, you know, back a week or so ago, but when Apple broke above one hundred and twenty dollars, um, you know, it's uh, and that that's like a perfect example of a setup that I'll look for. You know, it had a base, it gapped up, it based again, broke out above one hundred and twenty, and and on good volume, and that was the buy setup. Um, for another example, you know, one of the um, the biotechs that I like right now is. Uh, is VRX, and so um, if you look at that, that this actually has uh, it's, it's uh, you know Valiant Pharmaceutical, so yep. VRX. Can you can you see that on your screen? <laughs> if you look at the Hangout, it should be you should be able to see it. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, got it. Cool. All right, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So back when it was breaking out above, uh, when FIA, and th is this is this an intraday chart. You got up here. Uh, one second, I can adjust it. Hopefully. There we go. That's a daily. Yeah. All right. So perfect. I mean, so you know, uh, huge gap up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, on good earnings, good guidance. Uh. All these things, and um, so obviously I'm not going to buy it right there. But um, but when it pulls back and it, and it forms kind of a, a base off of that, or if it pulls back, kind of makes a bull flag, you know, something like this, then um, then that will be a place to, to buy it. You know, something that for for all of y'all that are hanging out here in the chat room, I assume that a lot of you are day traders, and so 
I'll give you something that you can use too as day traders, which can actually give you um, a little bit better of an entry than, than what somebody that's just looking at a daily chart might want to get. Um, so if you think about a trend, you know, an uptrend and a downtrend. So this is obviously in an uptrend, right? On uh, on uh, on variant. Now let's we're just going to draw an assumption here, and I'll play this out for you guys. That um, the assumption is that it's going to be uh, just a classic three-day pullback. Okay, so that's just a very classic uh, pattern and uh, little little bull flag. Now, if you look at this three-day pullback, if you're watching that on a 15-minute chart, right? What's going to actually happen in the context of that 15-minute chart is that on this daily chart, of course, it's in an uptrend. But over that three-day period, it's going to have started a downtrend, right? So your classic buy symbol, if you're doing this off of the daily chart, is just going to be after the three-day pullback, for example, it goes above the high of a prior day. That's just a you know, basic, simple technical analysis buy point. If you go in and you look at this, uh, say, the 15-minute chart or even uh, a five-minute chart if you're really willing to kind of be shaken out a little bit more, but risk you can risk even less. But I'll just use a 15-minute chart. Um, and you look for it to have a, a pattern like a double bottom or you look for that trend line to break or you look for like a 2B bottom pattern to occur. So when you see that, what can happen is that, first of all, you end up getting into the stock maybe a dollar, dollar and a half uh, under that initial buy-in point. And then so also, you end up risking, you know, a couple of bucks less. I mean, your stock point is a couple of dollars less. So then what you can do, because from a risk management point of view, the number of shares that you're buying should be determined by how much risk you're taking. So just very simply, if you're risking a dollar, you should be trading all things, all other things being equal, you should be trading twice as many shares as if you're risking two dollars. Well, so you were able to get into this risking a dollar instead of two because you just broke that trend line. And so you got in uh, before it signals on that daily chart. And now, also what's going to happen is that, and this sort of plays into the AIs doing things and playing with technical analysis, because as soon as it does come up on that daily chart, there's going to be activity in it. There's going to be a surge towards it. It's going to, uh, you know, we used to always call it, you know, market makers playing games and screwing with things, and now it's, it's AIs that do it. Uh, but it's the same thing. You can sell into that. Then you've got your profit there. You made you know a couple of bucks, and and you're basically riding the whole trade for free, and so you know if you if you're sitting here all day and you're watching the markets intraday, then that's the sort of thing that you should be looking to do in terms of of your entries. But if you're not sort of looking and and sitting here all day, then you know then you can just use those daily chart entry points. If, I hope that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so just breaking down the momentum side of things. Before this thing takes off, are there any particular tools that you use to, you know, uh, 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 to kind of ascertain, you know, uh, I don't know, order flow activity or anything like that that's likely to lead to this type of scenario, um, or do you wait for the after the fact and then, you know, use use that initial momentum to jump into the market? Now I just, I personally just, I have um, you investors business daily tech smith. Okay. I use that at night. Um, I use TC2000 because it's it's quicker to go through. So like what my process is at night is I'll go through TC2000 because I can go through about 2,000 stocks in maybe three hours. Yeah. And um, and so I'll make a list, you know, interesting stocks, uptrending uh, bases, uptrending continue that need to pull back, pullbacks. And so I've got these different lists of stocks. Uh, and then I'll maybe have a couple hundred of those written down by the end of the night. Then I'll go over to TechSmith. Now, I usually don't have to look at a couple hundred of them on TechSmith because with TechSmith, what I'm really looking for is just the, you know, the EPS ratings and just the different things that IBD has on them. And, um, and so there's usually just a couple of different ones that I have. And then during the day, you know, after day, just a trade station. But I don't do anything, anything fancy or no, just 
look at the charts. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, on to like the last segment of uh, the interview today. What do you think of the market going forward? Um, what are the risks you're looking at? Uh, what are you looking forward to? And you know, how do you think things are going to evolve and change? Uh, you know, what do you think about that type of scenario? Those scenarios. Um, well, I think the the market's going to we're, we're going to continue to see more and more towards AIs and, and robots mm -hmm. trading. Um, I think that's kind of something that um, that we'll see everywhere, and and so you get into a situation where a lot of the um, especially like for day traders, a lot of the bigger name stocks have, have become almost impossible to day trade. You know, it used to be when I started, you know, for example, if a stock traded under a couple hundred thousand shares a day, you yeah. didn't really want to go near it. And now it's sort of a situation where those stocks are just trading a couple hundred thousand shares a day. You can actually day trade them because um, there's not enough activity in them. There's not enough, there aren't enough players that the AIs are really involved, so you're dealing more with humans. Um, and so I think that trend will, will continue to evolve and, and there'll probably be less and less places there to go or you just have to pick your spots more carefully in terms of like, you know, an overall market opinion. That, that was an interesting point you raised about the AI. I, I'd, you know, like to focus on that a little bit if that's okay. Um, so you think, so because we're seeing this prolifer proliferation uh, of, uh, you know, uh, algos and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, that the smaller trader, the trader, you know, the individual at home, uh, has less of a competitive advantage in the major markets. And you, th you, you think that there, there's likely to be a move to the smaller markets. Um, you know, pe penny stocks even. Do you think that's that's something a direction people are going to be heading in, like moving away from the bigger the bigger futures markets know. towards? Ask my man Tim Sykes about that. <laughs> I don't know. He'll tell you about the penny stocks. <laughs> so we're looking, or right, not necessarily penny stocks, but we're talking, you know, smaller, it's smaller like companies, broadcast, smaller volume things, um, okay. you know, that trade. Uh, but I think even over time, as as more sophisticated AIs come in and more players come in, yeah, it'll even move down. I mean, you'll start getting to where it'll be lesser and lesser and lesser volumes, and so things will get squeezed, you know, over time. And it's happening pretty quick. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of developments going on um, with AIs and with trading and that. I mean, uh, she talked to Wayne about it. It's like Wayne's vision of the future. I don't know if I like it, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so I think that that's I think that's going to be a trend. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, you you are following on that point with um with something else. Yeah, I know, and I lost my train of thought because uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so AI is the big thing for the future. Wayne thinks Wayne Wayne is a mutual friend of ours who thinks that you know as a lot of people do at the moment that jobs. You know, most jobs, pretty much everything is going to be dominated by some form of AI, and you know, humans are going to become obsolete um, as as our machine overlords take over. But <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if that happens. But moving. Wayne and, are, Wayne and I are investing in factories in India. Oh, okay. So. What what kind of factories? Uh, robot factories. No, uh, you know, anything. Just manufacturing facilities there and stuff. Um, because really, I, I think that that it is. Uh, you know, ty those yeah. types of jobs yeah. will always go. You know, for example, if you look at a computer, so let's say that, like right now, when they put a computer in a factory, it actually in the United States, it costs like sixteen to eighteen thousand dollars a year to yeah. run one of the robots. Okay, so, uh, and so if it's a very technical job and it needs some of this and some of that, and also uh, when they consider, you know importing it, you know, cost of shipments, import taxes, this and that. So then a lot of things that makes it uh, viable to, to move it back here and pay the 18000 um, But also, you know, even, even you're seeing actually, you know, when NAFTA came out here in the United States, it was all, all the jobs going to Mexico and, all, and this and that, and a lot of them did. But interestingly, you're also seeing even now it's gotten to the point where, uh, you know, even labor in Mexico 
Mm. It's cheaper for them, even, just to put robots in their factories, too. But eventually, as you go down the line, I mean, when you get to a place like India and Bangladesh where they pay people $5 a day, it's still cheaper to have people. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's going to be a long, long, long ways out until things like that happen. And uh, I mean, the India thing is actually just a whole whole thing with Modi in power for the next couple of years. I and mean, I'm actually really bullish on, on India, period. Um, and we're investing in hospitals there and, uh, and farmland and, and grain storage and grocery stores and, and a whole bunch of shit. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, that, that sounds really interesting. That sounds like some great stuff and some good investments. Um, it is coming up to the market open. As uh, as everyone knows, I really trade, so I am going to be... Let's, we're going to be wrapping things up now so uh, we can kind of move into the marketplace. Um, so just your, your final thoughts, um, I guess um, a good question to be asked is what, what would be your advice uh, to any trader out there who wants to be successful in the market? What is the one piece of advice that you would give them? Put you on the spot. Um, I, okay, you know what I say actually um, is, is to is to concentrate on is to go through keep a diary okay sure. record every single trade that you take and look for patterns and and you're gonna notice that there's certain things that you're really good at and there's certain things that you suck at and you know do more of what you're good at and less of what you're not good at okay excellent and um, and, to, and 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 I'll say something else to kind of um, to kind of put people like myself a little bit out of business here okay. <laughs> Which is, you know, people that write newsletters and, and and give trading advice and things like that. Don't depend on us for a long time because I don't know anybody that's actually successful as a trader that depends on other people's opinions. Um, you need to do your own research. You need to do your own work, and you need to learn for yourself how to do this. Uh, because otherwise, you're never going to have the confidence to stick to a plan. And to stick to a trade, and ultimately, you have to have confidence to stay in to stay in your trades. Otherwise, you just you're just jerking off. That's that's some great advice. That's some great advice, um, Brandon. It's been really good to have you on, Brandon Fredericks from uh, Fredrickson from iFiredWallStreet.com. If you want to follow Brandon on Financial Juice, he's in the news settings under the education section. So any blog posts or tweets or videos he puts out, you can have them directly in your news feed. Uh, Brandon, it was great to have you on. Hey, and, I'll, uh, uh, I'll stick around in the uh, I'll stick around just in the chat sure. for a little bit if people want to ask any questions or whatever. I can do that. So oh, excellent. That that be that would be very cool. And guys, I'm sorry if I kind of did it through this interview. It's my the first time doing it, so hopefully I wasn't too bad. And uh, Brandon, thanks a lot for your time, and uh, catch you again. Cool, man.